previously on the Resident Evil podcast. Am I am I the only one of us here who had to Google what Zootopia porn actually was? It's going to be real funny when we actually use the said word, but it's only going to be for this one character because they're actually acting on the zombies. But the zombies that we have aren't zombies, they're zeros. It's so funny. <laughs> I want the name of the person in Capcom who came up with 1969. I want the name, and I'm going to sit him down and give him a good old talking to. That bugged the shit out of me. I was like... <laughs> No, you've been a pharmaceutical company before. Stop it. <laughs> this, show's, this, show's gonna, gonna this show's broken the podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 80 of the Resident Evil podcast, where we bring joy, joy, joy to the Resident Evil community. I'm Nick, better known as Neptune. Let's see who's joining us today. He has waited. The day has come. Prepare yourselves for the darkest adaptation yet. It's the Batman. Hello there. He's not just for the living. It stars Tyrant. Hello there. When there's no room in New Zealand, he will walk the earth. It's Rombie. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> where will you be when the when the end begins? In a grave under a mansion? It's George Trevor. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi. And we have two very special guests. Our first is from the dazzling lights of Hollywood, former production assistant to the undead and now documentary maker, Jason Wynn Barraford. Greetings. Hello. Our second guest, a screenwriter and director and co-writer of a very special production. It's Brandon Salisbury. Hey, how's it going? Coming up on today's very special podcast, we are honoured to be joined by Brandon and Jason as we exclusively talk to them about the upcoming project, a feature-length documentary all about the first planned Resident Evil movie to be directed by the grandfather of zombies, Mr. George Romero himself. If you are a fan of his work and lament what could have been, you do not want to miss this podcast. We're also going to be uh, get, taking the opportunity to look at the Resident Evil movie franchise generally with our, with our special guest in our sub-discussion and a movie edition of Neptune's Biohazard Quiz. We now turn to our sub-discussion where we're going to have a quick discussion and look at the Resident Evil movies, the ones that have been released anyway, with our special guests. Uh, just a small note, everyone, this podcast was actually recorded back in May of this year. Therefore, our discussion on the Netflix Resident Evil TV show was done so before it drops in July. Please bear that in mind. Deep underground, in a top secret research lab, security has been breached. A deadly virus, capable of contaminating the entire world, has been released. Oh my god. We have to get out of this building! Who is that? It's the brakes! Okay, we're here to help. Now, an elite team has been sent in to stop it. Five hours ago, Red Queen went homicide. Who's the Red Queen? State-of-the-art artificial intelligence. The corporation's keeping a few secrets down here. But they have only three hours left before it begins infecting and mutating the whole human race. Everyone stay calm. You have to get out. Don't listen to anything she says. She's a holographic representation of the Red Queen. She may be our only way out of here. How is she still standing? She isn't standing now. Resident Evil. You're all going to 
die down here. So welcome one and all, welcome one and all. I wanted to open the floor to us all about how everyone sees the Resident Evil movie franchise as, as you know, as it stands. It's one of those interesting ones. It's it has to be the longest running video game to you know to movie franchise going. I can't. I'm just trying to think. Is there anything long? I, no, no, it's the longest running and the most financially successful currently. Mm, but in com- critically, I think like, Sonic's probably taken over in terms of you know general oh, popular- yeah. popularity yeah. and that kind of thing. But it's it's one crit- 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 critical. It was very middle of the road pretty much all yeah. the way through. But Detective Pikachu, uh, Sonic, they've done critically better than than Resident Evil ever did, and and a lot of other video game films. Uncharted did okay. Uncharted did okay. Yeah, it's not not critically amazing, but it wasn't bad either. So on the Resident Evil podcast, we, we've spoken a few times about the movie. We've, done a, we've even done a couple of audio commentaries, which are always amusing to listen to. And I'm interested to hear from you, Bran and JB, about where you guys feel the Resident Evil movies have done well. Um, any particular points that you've you've enjoyed, or where do you think it's kind of gone a bit off off piste? I've only watched the first three. I think uh, after Extinction, I uh, kind of saved my money. Thankfully, <laughs> with uh, YouTube, I managed to watch some of the uh, highlights, uh, what few there are. I enjoyed the, the first one to an extent. I felt like it kind of missed a lot of marks. I'm trying to, trying to be as nice as I can. I <laughs> You, you, you don't need to be as nice as you can be as honest as you want to about this because I think it's one of those things where I think all of us have been relatively critical if we need to be. I mean, unless you know, I know why. It's not really Resident Evil. It it doesn't capture what I would expect after playing the series. I agree. Uh, the main character Alice is more of a a Mary Sue. In fact, that became very apparent with the sequel. I felt the the first movie was more balanced between some of the horror elements, even though there wasn't much blood and gore. I don't think we really got blood and gore until the third movie. By Apocalypse, just hearing the cast and crew's thoughts on the movie and then actually watching the movie, and you get what felt like a five-foot-tall guy on stilts trying to play Nemesis, and it comes off as very stiff and Frankenstein like rather than the the fast moving freight train that he, he felt like in the third game and then he gets punched in the chest by Alice and is kind of a, a punching bag. So I, I really did not like the second movie. I didn't like uh the fact that Alice every time Jill would try to do something, Alice could do it better. So there was definitely uh some subtext there I think about what Paul was trying to do. By the third one they, it just kind of went off the rails, even though I did like the cinematography on it. I did like the creature effects. And then just for the bits and pieces I saw of 4, 5, and 6, it felt like we got diminishing returns on... I mean, there, there are some cool elements in the, the fourth one with the uh, the executioner enemy in the um, the shower. I thought the, that fight scene was really cool. I did not like the Wesker fight scene. It's a CG mess and kind of has no um, no movement. The the camera is very static, and you just kind of get these weird, like, zip, zip, zip sound effect as, you know, CG Wesker is kind of blurring across the screen. And it not only did not look realistic, but there, there's no motion to it. You'd almost expect the, the camera to be, like, whip panning with it to kind of give you this sense of movement. Um, I almost imagine they... They just held the camera still, and the actor that played Wesker, which, as an aside, he was actually in George Romero's Land of the Dead and Diary of the Dead. So there is a connection there with George Romero. Uh, he had a, a small role in Land of the Dead, and then he was one of the one of the main characters in Diary. And then the by the sixth movie, I heard so much negativity about it. I I think I've watched maybe two two scenes from it one just to watch how terrible the editing was Uh, (laughs) that is some god-awful editing and the second uh was the fight that she has with dr isaacs and i laughed hysterically because paul anderson seems to regurgitate a lot of other popular ideas from better movies and I never really heard anyone speak about it, but it was hilarious how that entire fight scene with just Sherlock Holmes and uh, 
Moriarty's fight scene from uh, Sherlock, A Game of Shadows by uh, Guy Ritchie. I mean, it was the same concept, it was just more technological. But this idea that, you know, they're thinking in their head how they're going to fight one another and they kind of play it out in their minds and you kind of get both sides of how they're countering in their heads before they actually go through with the fight. That was absolutely taken from that movie, which came out in 2011. So I, I just found that really hilarious that, I mean, that, that was probably the most blatant one. I know the, the original film, the first two, three or so were, you know, everyone would always comment how it was blatantly inspired by the Matrix, but that one had to have been the, the most outright ripoff of a much better movie. Mm, I've got that to look forward to. I've not seen the final chapter yet, so there we go. JB, what about you? What's your kind of like impression of the of the, the legacy, if you like, of the of the Resident Evil movies, and obviously your knowledge as well? Uh, um, Paul Anderson is a, he's a hack. Uh, so I had a very big bias going into the first movie, uh, but it's odd because to be fair to him, I I paid to see it in theaters. I bought two tickets, not because I gave anything. Uh, I didn't care at all about what was coming out but uh one of my things that i did for george was take care of his youngest son and andrew at the time was eight years old nine years old and he said let's go see resident evil i was like anderson of course as a young man young child he did not know anything about what was going on behind the scenes about everything else. You know, last thing I'm going to do is like, you know, stomp the wishes of a young child who I care about. So I was like, okay, we'll go. So we went to Century 3 Mall in Pittsburgh, paid and sat there. And I'm just like, I probably have steam coming out of my ears the entire time. But uh, watching, watching, it underwhelmed me. And it clearly underwhelmed the eight or nine year old Andrew because 15 minutes in the movie, he turns to me and says, can we leave? I was like, yep, let's go get your really? stuff. So we, we left. And he had no idea about uh, what his father had been going through with the property at all. So How'd you get him into the center? Eight years of 15 in UK. <laughs> you, can, I know, right? you, can get, you can get children in accompanied by an adult. A company a I mean, back in the back in the nineties, my mother just used to buy me a ticket and then I walk right in by myself. They don't care. No, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's not right. as restrictive. It's money. I mean, you you hear nowadays about how the the cinemas are you know struggling at times, and you've seen um, how many of them were kind of on the verge of going bankrupt, like uh, AMC, I think, was one of them. So I mean, the, at this point, they'll they'll take they'll take money from anyone. Oh but, yeah. Uh, the nineties yeah. were very loose. The only the one thing I do admire about Paul Anderson is. He is very good in the pitch room. He got the gig for Mortal Kombat after only having one film that was not even... I, I mean, Shopping was a pretty good movie. Uh, I did see that back in the day prior to Mortal Kombat coming out. And I, I thought that was pretty good. And he did finally get Resident Evil out of development hell and he got alien versus predator out of development hell and he kind of gets a lot of good gigs and he's kind of learned some of the things that other successful directors have done like pan artists come in with like beautifully painted pictures and uh, he's very good at a pitch so i have to at least admire that much out of him and i think when he had more more reigns kind of set to him like with mortal Kombat, event horizon soldier like a lot of his earlier films he was a much better director i think he should never write and direct he's he's not very good <laughs> Well, that, that, that's something we've we've discussed about a few times. I think on the on the podcast, we've Batman. You're, you, you've you've always been a bit of a fan of Event Horizon and and Sean as well for Mortal Kombat. You've always thought they're actually pretty decent decent movies. But yeah, I don't have a problem with him as a director. You know, he's clearly very competent in a lot of areas. But yeah, just never ever give him a pen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that the the interest as we kind of touched at the beginning of the, of the kind of sub discussion was just this longevity of it. So clearly, you know, that there's been a general favoritism towards the franchise it's done remarkably well at 1.3 billion the paul anderson movies i think rob i think it's about right uh the box office was 1.2 1 1.2 billion yeah. i think last i looked but then that doesn't include all the other like it's still obviously came out 
20 years ago so it's um dvds home video rentals cable screenings all the rights mm. ownerships they would have made yeah probably would have been closer to three billion i wouldn't be surprised totally how much of that is down to the ip itself though quality Bold. of the film yeah quality of the films aside my anger towards paul anderson's take on the series particularly the first film which i know you know a lot of people quite like that one um but i just see it as a poor poor aliens knockoff but how you know it feels like he's he's hijacked the franchise in a way because he's you know you take out the odd reference to umbrella corporation and t-virus out of that first film and it could be you know a completely original franchise well that was yeah there's an entire reason behind that (laughs) yeah Yeah, i know which i'm sure you know you guys will go into in more detail but that was my sort of overriding anger at the time this just what didn't have anything to do with the games we were used to and obviously that got worse as the series progressed and and of course it then as i've kind of covered on the um on our website that then impacted upon the games well making you know making more and more references to this franchise I think it's interesting because what it is, I mean, there is truth in that, no no question. But then on top of it, it becomes its own franchise where people who maybe never played the game see the movie or had seen, you know, say it's, imagine it's 2003 and there are still video stores and you go down to rent something and you see this action movie on the shelf called Resident Evil and you go, that vaguely sounds to me as a title. You don't really realize it's a game because you've never really played the games. You rent it out. You kind of go, oh, that was silly but enjoyable fluff. And then, you know, the next one comes out and you, you might go, oh, I'll go see that. The last one wasn't that bad. And I think that was kind of where the longevity of the franchise came from. That There was a lot of people who just went and saw them just because they were silly fluff. Silly and fluff. <laughs> like it, it's, it's, it's the best way I can describe it. It's just like it's, it's brainless. You don't have to think much about it. And once the movie's over, you don't really normally think much more about it afterwards. And there's, a, there's an entire genre style of movie out there that people enjoy. That's your actual blockbuster. And that's also another thing I could, yeah. could credit Anderson for is that he makes very thoughtless films. You don't have to put too much brain effort into them. Case in point, the last Mortal Kombat movie, when that released it, it was a $50 million It made 80-some million at the box office, which normally would be considered a flop. But it was released during the middle of the pandemic. Pandemic. It did day and date release on HBO Max, I believe, and it apparently is still holding as number one on HBO Max, and it got a sequel now. So, I, I think when it comes to nowadays, the the studio system is now looking to these other revenues to kind of get a better picture of how well a movie is doing and whether it trends longer on different platforms and different releases. So I wouldn't be surprised if Welcome to Raccoon City did better than uh, than what it did before. I, I think the only anomaly really is if you release on Netflix because you run the risk of like Cowboy Bebop and getting cancelled like 18 days after you released. Well, Bran, you're a professional. That is a, a beautiful segue into the Netflix show. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear what, JB in particular, you think about the Netflix art Resident Evil. Where where do you see this? You know, I know we've only seen a, a couple of teaser trailers, but what, what's your take on that? I think that it might be a little uh, too little too late. As the other guest mentioned before the uh the mythology that anderson's run on resident evil kind of created a fan base on its own and people wanted to see the sequels to his universe who may or may not have ever played the game so maybe that's why return of raccoon city dipped a little bit because it's not the res ev that they grew up with watching not playing but watching so it's a i'm sure it's gonna be great and i i wish them all the best but but it's a tough one when people have for two decades now associated Resident Evil with movies, which has been much kind of probably simpler and more pervasive for the crowd than the games have been. But I'm a purist. I like to see the games and the uh, see that storyline progress farther. So I'm a little bit disappointed that Return to Raccoon City was not a requel, reboot, remake. So it's, but I wish them the best. I think it's going to do well, but it almost has to reprogram the viewer for what they're seeing. 
Well, I think that's no. what kind of George was George was kind of hinting at that there is a you know the the narrative is going to arguably need to be stronger if if as you say if if you if you're going to think that Anderson movie fans because the, the, there has to be some you know that the financials kind of say other you know say, say that there are they they might be going well that's not that's not the universe I've watched and if that's the explanation to why Welcome's Raccoon City so didn't do particularly well. This is another take on it. They're gonna they're gonna have to get a strong core audience at the beginning to keep it going. Originally greenlit as a connection to the Anderson series, I believe back uh, around the time that the final chapter finished its run, about two months after was when uh, the reports came out that Constantine Film was developing a sequel series or side story or spinoff to the uh, the Alice films and reading. You know, some of the drafts, it still feels very much connected. And I think that's why there's so much confusion, because you have you have the original concept, which to me, it kind of just felt like this giant spinoff where it was going to go through kind of sideways through a lot of the Anderson films and kind of flesh things out. And to me, it almost felt like the flashbacks were an origin story to the Anderson universe, Albert Wesker, showing you like what he was doing prior to um, Resident Evil Extinction. And that to me was like, okay, well, I didn't necessarily enjoy the pilot script, but there was enough in there that said, wow, they're, you know, they're at least um, trying to make the Wesker character more fleshed out, and more, uh, more demented and ultimately a likable villain in that you enjoy his presence on screen and then with the casting and now watching the the trailers you kind of get the feel that they're now doing like a a fourth universe of resident evil because you already have the video games and even those you could say are two different universes because you have the originals and now you have the remakes and then you have the anderson films and you have welcome to raccoon city as its own thing and now you're getting the netflix series so for me i haven't been as enticed to watch it because like i can't it, you know it, it's not you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe here. Like, I don't care to try and follow five different types of canon and keep up with it. I don't even, I mean, I don't even watch much of the Marvel movies because I don't feel like going to the theater, you know, six times a year and watch TV series and spinoffs and read comics and try and keep up with everything that's going on. So for me to try and keep canon and lore straight in my head, like, I don't feel like restarting again. And maybe that was part of the issue with Welcome to Raccoon City is a lot of that general audience just didn't care to start over. So I, I don't know. I don't know if the Netflix series is going to do good or not. Again, getting back to last November when um, Cowboy Bebop released on Netflix, they canceled it pretty quickly because they didn't get the viewership that was needed for the budget. And... Unfortunately, unlike a, a normal cable production company where you kind of get episodes weekly, you know, if you got 10, 12, 20 episodes across an entire year being released, you can kind of pick up an audience along the way. You can have a soft start and end up becoming um, a really big show. But I think when you throw all your eggs in one basket, you release on one day. And everyone's got to get through 18 hours worth of show in one sitting. That can be a little much. And, you know, some people just don't have that time to binge everything at one time. And it'd be kind of unfortunate if because this show definitely feels like it has a pretty sizable budget. I think they said there's, what, eight or ten episodes. They're probably close to an hour apiece. Uh, that, that's a lot of content to try and try and get in at one time. And Netflix can be very unforgiving with their with their money. You know, it looks like they put a lot of money on this based upon the franchise and the name value of it. But to me, the the recent, you know, interviews that cast and crew and the, the writing team have been giving about, you know, it's connected to the games and, you know, everything's going to make sense and they're going to be bringing in elements and you know this is definitely canon to the games like to me that just i hate to say it but it it, it feels like they're scrambling to try and convince as many people as possible to watch this for whatever reason you know to try and you know whatever they can say to get people in the seats so that they they don't get canceled because they they know the stakes that are on the line and you know i'm not saying that they're lying but it just feels like maybe they're stretching the truth a little bit on where the series falls. I mean, especially once you fans have picked apart the trailer and seen elements of Resident Evil 4 and 
You got the writer talking about how he wants to bring in uh, elements from Resident Evil 8, which supposedly it had already happened by this point. And it, it just kind of feels like they're they're scrambling to try and convince everyone that, you know, this is definitely going to be canon and nothing's going to be different from the video games and it's all going to make sense. Just keep watching it. Eventually it'll make sense. Dear God, please keep watching it. We shall we shall see we'll, we'll, with bated breath. And that's uh, kind of com- coming out in July in Netflix. So that'll be probably dropping all in one go, I would imagine. Thank you for that. I think that was really just quite an interesting uh, angle in, into it just from perhaps Perhaps people more to do with the kind of movie movie side of things. It's interesting that the kind of views align a bit, although as people know, I I, I still don't mind the first film. <laughs> but that's fine. I can I can be comfortable with that. That does kind of finish our sub discussion, I think, just as a kind of overview of the Resident Evil movies. I now want to turn our attention to the reason why we're here. Brand JB, take the floor. This is a discussion on your amazing George Romero Resident Evil documentary. <laughs> It's fabulous. I mean, it's I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I love making the movies, and it's it's great to, that there's a game which is, you know, uh, it's like a flashback to to that genre. And it's you know, I can feel maybe a little bit like I had some influence on it, and uh, so I feel very uh, flattered, you know. Welcome everyone to this very special interview. We are very excited about this. As mentioned at the top of the podcast and a bit earlier, Jason and Bran are the creative force behind an upcoming feature-length documentary focusing on the fabled George Romero Resident Evil movie. Alas, it never quite came into fruition, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we begin, uh, let's find out a bit more about our guests, because when you learn about their background, what they've been up to, I think you'll be uh, very excited about their project. So, Jason, JB, should we start with you? As I understand it, you've, got, you've already hinted you were uh, an assistant to George. Do you want to elaborate on your, your bit, 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 bit about your history and how you came up to end up to do this? project yes uh please and and i i was george's personal assistant for eight years so my day job was going to his house every single day dealing with all of the different projects he had going on and normally we'd spend a whole bunch of about three to six months out of the year in los angeles and so i was there at the center of when resident evil was going on and i knew what impact that it took on George to see it go from something very optimistic to something very, very bad. And I'm very happy, finally, to share what happened in the George camp with Resident Evil because Brandon is and, and Rob are, they're putting together an amazing project and I'm so excited and thrilled to be a part. Indeed, absolutely. So, Bran, did you want to tell everyone um, what you've been up to, your kind of history? Um, with this project and just to you know tease everyone about what, what's what's to come i have like a like in and out history of you know george's films and such i'll try and be as brief as i can one of the first horror films i ever watched was night of living dead and that was done because my mother absolutely loved horror films my father not so much he was a you know john wayne clint eastwood kind of guy he always referred to uh, like horror films and sci-fi movies and things like that as weird shit. So my horror films never really affected me. I was, I mean, they, they scared the, the hell out of me. But uh, Night of Living Dead, I actually watched on my own by accident. I kind of figured out how to work a, a VCR. That's what you had before Blu-ray for the younger audience, you know, before DVD players. But, uh, you know, I learned uh, there, there's this awesome dude. Um, clamshell cassette case had zombies all over it real like really creepy paintings the zombies had like red eyes i think and i don't know it it just kind of mesmerized me so i popped this in and night of the living dead the original was just i mean for i i had to have been five maybe six i don't remember exactly it scared the hell out of me yeah 
great appropriate and I, viewing, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it, it definitely got me the horror itch. But I was terrified of zombies. I didn't watch anything with zombies for years. And then um, I had just recently got a PlayStation uh, for Christmas back in 97. Uh, I think I was 13 at the time. Something like that. And that's when the uh, campaign started for Resident Evil 2. And it was all over the TV. And I remember watching the uh, the American commercial. And it, it really intrigues me. Uh, I, I was fascinated by it. it and it, it had that you know iconic line that still sticks with me. With uh, Chief Iron screaming, everyone's going to die. And I was like, ooh, this, this looks good. I'm a horror fan. And that this is like the first horror video game that I'm gonna play. So uh, a buddy of mine bought 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 the game. So went over to his house and we're playing it, and absolutely loved it. And then of course you know it had that iconic sticker on the the case that said "Win a part in the movie." So I got my copy, submitted it, never got the role. I don't think anyone ever did. Throughout the year, I became this huge Resident Evil fan. And of course the news came out that George A. Romero, creator of Night of the Living Dead. Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, was um, going to direct. So, of course, it was like, well, I, I need to watch some of his films. I want to go back and re-watch Night of the Living Dead. So I remembered it as being incredibly terrifying. So I conjured up all my courage and rewatched it and uh, really got to sit there and enjoy it and loved it. And then 98 just so happened to be the 20th anniversary of Dawn of the Dead, the original. So it was airing on... Uh, some of the premium channels, so I happened to watch it one summer, that summer in 98, and absolutely loved it. Uh, and, you know, it made it even more terrifying when they're talking about, uh, they mentioned Harrisburg at one point, and, you know, Harrisburg's not that far from where I grew up at, so the, the fact that you can see the Pennsylvania National Guard in it, and, you know, all these locations are right from Pennsylvania where I live, and it fascinated me. And, of course, uh, Tom Savini's remake of Night of the Living Dead had come on right after. So I kind of got a good two-hour block of George Romero classic zombie movies. So I became a, a really big George Romero fan. And with it being the uh, kind of the heyday of the Internet, started following the movie. And then when uh, it was announced that he had been fired, I was uh, really devastated because I felt, you know, this is the guy if you want to make a, a good Resident Evil film. I mean, here, the here. guy. There is no other person that could have brought Resident Evil to life with the kind of quality that you expect. Uh, something that would be more than just a video game movie that would, mm. you know, be... Because he, he deals with uh, subtext and layers and social commentary. And I, I think that would have given a lot of a lot of uh, meat onto the, the skeletal frame that uh, the games have. Yes, so, absolutely. There is a so, lot of so that in for, the games. Yeah. So for years, I kind of personally researched things and would kind of follow all the rumors. And, and then, of course, you know, when I heard the um, the leaked plot synopsis and characters for the Anderson film, I was like, you know, well, what the hell is this shit? <laughs> um, Sorry, just to, just to kind of what I want to think about then is that people know that Romero was attached to the Resident Evil movie. As you say, it points out in you know, the stickers and all, all that kind of thing. And Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and, he, he, did, he was going to write and direct. And, right, um, and, there we go. and even more so, perhaps even, and we'll certainly come on to this a bit later, is that he directed the Biohazard 2 live-action commercial. Yes, and, and uh, JB was actually there during the filming of that. Which I was is there. very exciting. And one thing that I should point out here is, uh, you know, back when uh, George would do interviews about Resident Evil, he would always mention having an assistant play the, the video game for him, and that was actually JB. So for anyone that's ever wondered who that person was that got to work with George and uh, play the game for him so that George could write the script, that's JB. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So just to, just to be clear for everyone, so what have you and, and Rob and JB produced? What is coming out and when can we see it? Just to kind of tie up on a couple loose ends. It was around 2000 when I decided that I wanted to become a filmmaker. And throughout high school, I would study filmmaking. And then by the time I finished high school, I decided uh, to join the military instead. So 
for like 12 years, I served in the armed forces. Uh, when I got out, I decided to try and restart that, though not initially. I spent a couple years just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I did a YouTube video that was kind of about the, the history of Resident Evil. And then around the time of the pandemic, I shut it down and was like, you know, this is a good time to just sit down, write scripts, and kind of go full on for, uh, for making movies. So... I decided, I think like end of 2019, before the pandemic, that I wanted to kind of redo my George A. Romero Resident Evil video. Because I, I knew there would be, there had to be more information. And I, I didn't like the quality of it. So that was around the time that the George A. Romero archive at the Pittsburgh University were, had announced that they, they had all this stuff that belonged to George. So I knew that I was going to restart all the research and kind of do maybe... At the time, I was like, I could probably do a, a good 30-minute documentary. Probably nothing more. And then that kind of spiraled out of control due to the pandemic with uh, the university was closed. But I stayed in constant contact with uh, Ben, Ben, Ben Rubin. He's the uh, curator of the George A. Romero archive. So I stayed in constant touch with him. I used to, I think I used to refer to myself to him as his constant harasser because I, you know, contact him, you know, almost weekly, just asking for updates on when I could get in there. And then I managed to track down Rob. I had helped Rob years ago, mm. maybe, maybe 2013. Well, yeah, whenever. About, about yeah, when you were originally writing your article, and uh, I had helped with just a couple tidbits to kind of flesh things out, I managed to refine the uh, the only article that was ever written on the McElroy script. I think that was the the big thing I had helped with you, mm. and that took a lot of digging. The uh, funny story about it: the only thing that could actually make it pop up on search engines was when I typed in Jill Valentine shower scene, and apparently that was the the, the <laughs> kicker. To, to bring it up because nothing else would ever pop up. Recently that got reshared and the reaction, especially from some of the people on our Discord, um, especially females, we were like, oh my God, that's horrendous. And we're like, it's typically, atypically in very 90s, very 90s, oh, yeah, especially yeah. for, for it, the it, it sort was, of horror writer or who was it, writing that at the time. And we can get into that then, you know, it, the, the McElroy script is its own beast. But anyway, I, con I managed to contact Rob by kind of following breadcrumbs to figure out where he was because we had talked on the Horrors Alive forums, which no longer mm. exist. So it, it took a little bit to track them down. But I had talked to him about, hey, you want to help me research and write this documentary? So we started work on that. And then last year, it was starting to like very much balloon into this much bigger, bigger thing. And then I just happened to run into JB on a Resident Evil group on Facebook. Someone had made a post about the, the George Romero movie and people were discussing it. Uh, he had replied to me about, you know, s s with bits and pieces of information. And, you know, he happened to say that he was the assistant. Well, with it being the internet, I was like, cool. I don't believe you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So he said uh, that he would be at the Living Dead weekend, which is a huge yearly festival that they have in Monroeville. Well, I just happened to be going to that. So I said, I'll see you there. We actually met up and got along great. And he was really interested in what I was doing once I pitched the project to him. And we've been working on that ever since. There's actually a, a whole team behind this. So JB and his brother, they have Image 987 Productions. So they're brought on. I'm contracted under Key 13 Films, which is with a, a friend of mine, Matt Anderson. Matt Anderson is the executive producer behind this. Then we brought on Grey Ladder Productions from Italy. They got attached to it. And then we got a whole group of investors to basically give us money. You know, we came in with a number and they exceeded that. And very since then, I was very surprised. yeah, we... Because there was so much going on, not only with the information, because I didn't want to just do a documentary. I, I didn't want to just do this documentary of talking heads and 
you know, make it 90 minutes long. And I'm very creative. Documentaries are not my forte. They're not something that I, I love watching them, especially uh, when they deal with movies. Not so much interested in making one. So I came in with my own creativity and kind of pitched this idea of what if we were to add more of a creative lens to it. So instead of just filming Jason in a room and him telling his story, I was like, what if we go to an abandoned mansion? Not a house, a mansion. And we dress it up like the Spencer estate. And we get him, you know, we get that resonant evil dynamic lighting diegetic lighting and really make him feel like he's sitting in the Spencer estate and get him to tell a story. And then what if, you know, we get a lot of um, really iconic shots and we kind of dress this whole thing up so it feels almost like a horror film in its own right. And then we get all these other people that are connected to the movie the games, uh, people that knew George and kind of get them to tell their stories and kind of do things in a creative creative way to really sell the the style and uh, love that George had for this movie that he was going to make. And then the last thing I pitched was, why don't we try and see if we can somehow film four or five scenes from the script, oh, wow. you know, break down George's style and kind of find the common the common elements that make you feel like it's a George Romero film and kind of inject that of course you know that's the that'd be really cool to do still up in the air if we'll be able to do it but that's a goal is Ooh. to is to film a couple iconic scenes not only from that script but scenes that were based on iconic scenes from the games my team and I, we actually went to Capcom and got permission to do this. So we cool. have a written agreement with Capcom. We actually went and contacted Constantine Film. So we actually did all the right steps legally to do right. this. And, you know, JB knows George's widow. And I've spoken to her personally over the phone about this project to get her blessings that, you know, this is, you know, this is all being done out of love for George. This is not a money making scheme. It's not being done to, you know, use George's name to somehow dig up dirt on Constantine or Anderson or any of the other creatives involved. You no, know, you're right. It's, all done. it's to set yeah, the record straight. And there were five people in the room when these decisions were being made. Two of them has have passed, but the other three should go on the record saying what happened. That's why what Brendan is doing and what Robbie has written, it's it's going to be the definitive of what happened with George Romero's Resident Evil. I think I think it's worth explaining just so people who, who maybe have never followed this, but um essentially reason why it's such a mystery in some respects of how this has gone and you hear different stories is because over a couple of year period, as far as the public was concerned, George was still attached, but he was never told officially that he was off. The internet was saying he's still attached. So even George himself, there's quotes from him over the period where he's like, the internet still says I'm attached. I don't know otherwise. And then there was this infamous quote where at the uh, E3, Yoshiki Yamamoto, who was the executive producer at Capcom and he's attached to the film franchise, especially the first movie that Anderson did, he literally was translated as saying that Romero had been fired, his script was no good, and it was taken verbatim. It was like, you know, that shot heard around the internet about how how the movie was. And so it was very interesting to see the sort of response online when with that happened. And But then George was still being attached, but now he's not writing, he's directing, and it, 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 it very much spiraled out of control. And what actually happened and what transpired is, is very much what this the idea of this film is Ooh. to explain it that's right and and so all respect to him he wasn't there it wasn't a capcom decision it was a constantine decision mm. too so i i was there i just like me george burnt Eichinger, robert Colzer, peter grunwald in the room when george got fired he knew he was fired but it was it damaged george it was i mean that was like the kick to punch to the gut it hurt him pretty big but i was there uh when it happened so so that's what uh brandon and i will go into that's what uh robbie is has so 
there's a couple of counters to some of the things that the Capcom producer said, but there's also mm. context. So I'll provide context as to why. This was, you know, palace intrigue the entire way. It's very interesting because it's not just the story of the Resident Evil movie. I think for it has a lot of interest to filmmakers where you can kind of see the inside story of just a single movie production where you get to see how development goes because we don't just jump right into it. We kind of set the stage by kind of explaining, you know, what Resident Evil is and why it was such, why it still is such a big game, but why that initial first game blew up the way it did. And we talk about George and his importance in film history and who Constantine Film are and their kind of uh, claim the fame leading up to acquiring the rights to Resident Evil. And we talk about Capcom and we kind of show these different individuals as people and you know we kind of get away from just the the normal internet discussions or just basic mm. articles that you'll hear we kind of get into that to set the stage so that we can kind of explain how you know the train starts moving and eventually gets derailed and why it did rob did an amazing job with the research digging up stuff that just isn't easily accessible on the internet and <laughs> You know, with with my obsession with the original movie production, you know, I could kind of remember like old articles as well. And we kind of went through back doors and saved pages to websites that just don't exist anymore and managed to kind of scrounge up all these little scraps. And finally, we, we and, and, and yeah, sorry, Brian. I was just going to no, say, no, I mean, the, part of it part of it was, was, was just, you know, finding people that were even just rumoured, trying to find stuff that happened after Romero's departure and, and, and figuring out, I mean, it hasn't factored into our script in the end, but just being able to find out some of the people who were approached to write what kind of led towards um, even how Anderson got his, his you know, I learned more about that just by, by looking into it, you know, how he got his footing and, and more about that whole process. It, I've learned a lot right across the whole gamut that's been very intriguing and, and it and a lot of it very much informs what we're putting together as far as the script and the idea of this film. When I grew up uh, on horror movies, the horror movies of the 40s and early 50s, zombies were always this sort of lower blue collar monster, you know, and uh, they had they were just vampiric. They were hungry for human flesh or blood or both. And uh, that's really their only motivation. They're not particularly evil. They just behave the way a herd of animals might behave, or herd, you know, hyenas, or that's what you have to watch out for. I mean, they're just driven. Since the beginning of the Resident Evil franchise in 1996, Zombies were at the forefront of the games, and while the series has moved back and forth from them, the fact is that these enemies, and indeed all modern zombies, are indebted to the 1968 film, Night of the Living Dead, directed by George A. Romero. The film was based on an idea George originally had, which included these ghoul-like creatures attacking people. His inspiration was by Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. However, Romero's creatures were instead the reanimated dead, and had a taste for human flesh. The fact that these people, once alive and now reanimated, were still human looking enough, could be people we once knew, all added a certain depth to the horror. Before this film, the idea of zombies was focused around possessed or hypnotised people rooted in Haitian and African folklores, and people saw the connection between this idea and Romero's almost possessed, singly focused undead creatures, and in doing so he created the newer, modern zombie. It is for this reason that zombies are sometimes called Romero zombies, and it is that George is referred to as the father, or even grandfather, of the zombie and or living dead. George directed many films, but of course the major contributions of the zombies found him directing six zombie-based pictures throughout his career. The 1968 film, Night of the Living Dead, not only introduced the zombies themselves, but due to a lack of copyright place in the film, both the film itself and his idea of zombies as shown within it both immediately went to the public domain for free and fair use to all. Without this mistake, it is possible that both George's career and the appearance of zombies within media would have been far different, and it is likely that even the Resident Evil franchise may not have started with zombies as their main enemy, if at all. George followed up Night with the film Dawn of the Dead a decade later. The movie follows a group of survivors who barricade themselves within a shopping mall to continue to avoid the zombies outside. 
You may note this sounds somewhat like Capcom's other well-known zombie game, Dead Rising, which follows a little bit of this concept. In fact, Capcom had to put a disclaimer on the original cover of the Xbox game to say the title had no connection to George's film. Dawn was also the main inspiration to Shinji Mikami in placing zombies as the basic enemy of that game during its early development. In 1985, George released the third of his film series, Day of the Dead, following a group of survivors from the military in an underground base. All three of his films had a horror focus, however George would use the subject matter of his films to explore subtext and other concepts, including warfare, racism, consumerism, politics and culture among many more things, creating further depth and discussion around these titles. I want to kind of go back to, and especially JB you can kind of answer this. So how did George get involved with the Biohazard 2 commercial? Because that's, that's, that's something that's an interesting story I think we can kind of talk about here and that, and that commercial shoot. It, the commercial shoot was, yeah, we got to go to LA. Okay, cool. We're going to shoot this commercial for Resident Evil 2. And that's, uh, I was not familiar with the game at that point. So we, uh, we get there and it was huge. We're shooting on like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We've shot everything out essentially Friday. It was a million and a half dollars. Peter Deming was the DP. He was and Scream Matt George was effects. And the the amount of the crew was over a hundred people. The amount of the press corps from Japan was over a hundred people. They had their own staging area just for the press corps. So we shot Friday night and then did a kind of a press junket with media people asking George's questions. And he he said to me, It's just like we could shoot a feature. With the money that this has, we could shoot a feature right now. <laughs> so, the creator, the original creator of Res F said that George was an inspiration for Res F. And so that's when discussions got kind of serious. It's like, well, they may, they may want to shoot a movie. George was not attached to a movie at the time that we did Biohazard 2, but it was, it was an exciting time. And then the prospect came up. The one thing, because when the prospect entered George's mind, he was thinking that, that you know, casual, not that he shot Night in the 60s. He shot Dawn in the 70s. He shot Day in the 80s. So he thought, well, okay, every decade, hopefully I could do something about the undead. So Rezev was kind of that. And then it blew up in his face because he was, I think, betrayed. But, you yeah, know, and I'm not knocking Anderson. I think uh, Brandon said it best that Anderson was looking out for himself. And he's he's a great pitch man in the room. And he knows how to play the game. George was not really a game player. He was outside of the system. He's in Pittsburgh uh, making movies that he really liked and cared about. And, but then when somebody is surprised Converting the person, the essential element, they're going to, they're probably going to win. So, and that's what happened. I think that uh, just to kind of um, touch base on that, the one thing that I've always heard about George was that he was never an angry guy. He was very friendly. He treated everyone on his sets like family. There, there was very much like uh, whenever he talked, it was truth. He wasn't a schemer. He didn't, you know, lie to people. What he what he said was true. Percent, one hundred. And this came from just talking to people that have worked with him over the years, and even fans of the the films, you know, got to be on great terms with him and, and became friends. And just hearing their stories about not just meeting George at a convention, but getting to know George on a personal level to the point where he's coming up and bear hugging them because. You know, he was a giant of a man. Yeah. Uh, I unfortunately never, never got to meet George. I had a chance one time and the, the stars just never aligned. And unfortunately, he he passed after that. But I've spoken to people before about how, you know, a lot of people just know George as George. And it's just size 10 font. You know, it's just George. That's all he is. He's just George. He's <laughs> family. For me, it, it looks like the Ben-Hur title font where it takes up, you know, half the fucking poster. And it's just it's George. You know, it's, it's George. Cinema, right. it's, it's, it's his epic, epic name. And unfortunately, I, I never had that chance to have that personal connection to him of actually being able to meet him. But Project came about as George Romero not only got me in horror films through his works, not only um, he inspired me to become a filmmaker and to become the kind of filmmaker I want to be where I'm very forthcoming and honest with people and I have good intentions and to just give 100% to the films I want to make. So what better way 
than to work with people that worked with George, like JB, to and I think, do something. This is one chapter of the story of George. Resident Evil is one chapter of the story of him that has never been read. It's never been told. And you are doing that. And that's why it's like so excited to be within this project. And what Robbie has written, holy smokes, what you and Robbie have written, it's like, this is like deciphering the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is like, holy smokes, how did they read my mind? You know, because this is very, very comprehensive. And so me as a George guy, I don't care. You know, I try not to hurt anybody else's feelings, but this is being told from George's point of view. I love that. I love that. That's why I'm honored to be a part. I was intrigued to hear, was it, was, was it JB who who had the opportunity to play the Resident Evil game and then inform uh, George in terms of like the narrative. Correct. Yes. Uh, if I could just ask, I, I mean, what a great opportunity to have. And I was just wondering in terms of how much you, I mean, were you just simply informing him of the narrative? Did, did, did you dare to sort of go as far as to sort of go into detail in terms of survival horror, but, you know, being a subgenre of horror and what, what, it, what it means, what it means to be survival horror and, you know, the, the tenants in terms of, you know, the, the low a- a- ammunition, the, you know, the fixed camera angles, all the kind of the atmosphere and the suspense that's generated from that, you know, it, it, it very much in contrast to, you know, kind of your call of duty, you know, zombie type games and, uh, just fascinated in terms of you know what kind of input you gave or you know on, on that on that in those terms when when george was attached and he first became uh, excited about res F, I would have a playstation hooked up to a dual vhs deck because we're talking late 90s you know there's, so there's no digital at that point i still had aol on hooked up to the phone line uh, so i would play the game as chris redfield uh, and i would be recording the entire time but because it was a dual vhs deck i'd put a blank into one side all my gameplay onto the other side and edit and record such that I mean, much more linear where, okay, here's the game, but here's not me fail. <laughs> so George Fox, <laughs> and he probably thought it's like, holy smokes, you blew through this thing. It's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> it's like I played for six hours, they added it down to an hour and a half. So that gave him an idea of what, what the story was. And the cut scenes were very important. And even for Peter, Peter Grunewald, he saw what I did. But at the same time, there was like these comic books for Res F as well. So to to kind of give them not just one option to see how it went, but several options. So, but George watched the entire the entire playthrough that I did in the late nineties, and it's like, okay, cool. That's why he added in things like Plant Forty Two and the shark. Those were in his script. Essential, uh, essential. Adding in the shark, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can. I think maybe that's the point of bringing up that um, you know, the gameplay elements in the time frame when when you guys were doing this, only the first two games existed. We didn't have a lot of this ancillary material. So George's script, or George and Peter's script, let's be more specific, because Peter, as you've pointed out, is the co-writer, right. has a lot of those elements, you know, from the first game that you obviously came from your recording and came from their understanding of the franchise. And, and obviously it was very important to George about the zombies. I and mean, there's definitely quotes from even on that by his two commercial just admitting that he he knows that he, he had an impact on this franchise and just like 100%. he did with every with every piece of zombie media from after 1968 so you know it's 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 so uncanny and i, and I think that was the thing that drew my attention originally it was just like he seemed like the most obvious perfect person and somehow the stars aligned and he managed to do this commercial and yet the stars didn't align for the movie which is to me the biggest shame like it, it, it has nothing to do with my interest or lack of interest in what came with paul anderson's movies it's just literally i feel like it's the biggest crime that he never got that chance because it was just seemed like such a perfect matchup that just should have just happened it should have just worked i agree with you but i did not control the ip you did not control the ip constantine controlled the ip so they made a decision based on a different set of standard than uh, horror fans resident evil fans zombie fans would have made 100 percent, 100 percent. the announcement that Constantine had the rights was back in January 1997, mm. which means that they probably got the rights before that, maybe December of 96. It's kind of yeah. awestruck that Constantine has owned the film right to Resident Evil for almost as long as the franchise has existed. I think it's still shocking in some respect, and that's one of those things, I, and it is in our script, kind of mentioned, but I, I remember thinking, well, should I put more emphasis on this? It's really an unheard of thing, especially back then, to be so confident 
It just shows you how massive that first game was that launched. So confident to sell your media rights to an unproven pod potential franchise. Because you got to think it's just one game at that point. It's just how clearly how strong Capcom saw the sales and believed in that brand that they were willing to put the media rights out so quickly. And it, it might some people might say, oh, it seems very greedy, or um, but I don't think so because Capcom up until that point had not really done that a lot with its franchises. I think Street Fighter was the only thing it had done before, and it had been many years after Street Fighter had existed before they started doing that. So it just shows you how how massive a success Resident Evil was, especially an unexpected success. Totally agree. With Capcom, it was odd because like on the uh, Biohazard 2 commercial, it's like, oh wow, these are these are super executives at Capcom because of the creation of Res Ev and things like that. But uh, these are young, young guys. I mean, they're like in their mid-20s and it's like, holy smokes. These guys are multimillionaires. Whereas Constantine was run by Bernd Eichinger at that point. And Robert Calzer was his next person down. So they, they had a very different approach because, because of age, because of wisdom that comes with age. They had a very different take on Resident Evil than the Capcom guys did, than George did. You know? I mean, if anyone's on the way, you can, you can Google uh, or go to YouTube and you can find the Biohazard 2 commercial, the live action commercial. It's quite infamous. It usually gets... It certainly got brought up back into the attention when Remake 2 came out. Mm. Uh, and arguably as well, Resident Evil 3 Remake as well, because obviously that, that kind of brought back live action in the opening credits, and everyone was oh, not the first time Resident yeah. Evil has been in live action. So that kind of brought it back. You can also see, I think, Biohazard France hosts the making of commercial as well, which is a fascinating insight into how this how this commercial kind of came into being. And as, that's, that's uh, part of the, the group that JB was talking about that was yeah. brought over. Um, they had a behind a full behind the scenes kind of group going around and asking questions and doing interviews and for the for yeah the one of the of one of the people involved in that that kind of helped let a lot of the additional details survive was Norman England. Um, mm. who I I've been on. I touched base with him about two years ago, and yeah, I think so it was I. two years ago, maybe a year ago. But but yeah, you know, he's been really helpful with uh, making sure that you know we we got all of his photography, and you know, he took a lot of pictures, and it was kind of hilarious to have met JB, and then to to get Norman's photographs, and you get to see JB standing side by side with george in like every other picture so it, it was kind of like that that fascinating look to be like wow it's just really cool to to see jb what in his 20s i think at the time yeah well, <laughs> this is more of a general question then i mean the, the biohazard 2 commercial itself is so it's, it's very classic romero very quite in, in your face and it's very intense and the you know the, the zombies look like the resident evil zombies but certainly with a bit of a hint of a tint of uh, romero's kind of older work as well and what do you i mean and, and obviously you guys know you know know the script and what the kind of production was what do you think george learned from the re2 work that he was that um that was going to directly influence the movie um and what, what overall do you think it would have been something quite different to what we've ever seen in, in the in the kind of live action franchise history of the game i i, I can speak on that brand please let me go but uh the original script for biohazard 2 was i think maybe two pages and it wasn't really a script because there was no dialogue. And so when George was on set, he'd be like, he would mention things to uh, Peter Deming. It's like, we should get a shot of this. We should get a shot of this. It's like little things like Brad Renfro's hand going over a case of bullets. None of that was in, was in the or original script. It's just like, but George was thinking visually the entire time. He was not following somebody else's recipe. He made his own dinner with that script. I was just going to say, what influences, you know, what, 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 did he learn anything, if you like, from RE2, from the Biohazard 2 commercial that I said he wanted to bring to the table? To go, I, I like what I did with that, you know, from I, Biohazard 2. I, I was going to say, Nick, I, I'm not speaking, and, and JB can probably agree, can confirm this or not, but essentially from what I remember reading and what I've, what I, you know, what I've ascertained, it's kind of similar to what he was saying, you know, that he hadn't, he'd done a zombie feature basically every decade, and at this point, that one for that decade was over was coming close to being overdue and it seems like that was the first time he'd worked with zombie performers again from for quite some number of years and the description that norman gives is uh, which i've put into the script is, a, is this great thing about you know that george looks excited to be like commanding a horde of zombies around <laughs> um like he's, he's in his element and i think that's what really ignited a certain passion especially for the resident evil project once 
he agreed to it that he really started to kind of feel like he had and he had did say this later uh later on after the project fell apart but you know that this was his opportunity to show people how to do this you know i know how to do zombies Zom- i've done zombies this is what i'm gonna do and you give me a budget and you know i can make it i can make it sing essentially that's brilliant. No, I I agree with that 100%. He had been, uh, because George had been stuck away from any uh, shooting any feature for years. And Dark Half was the last one before Biohazard 2. Then after the, the blow to his ego and self-esteem and everything with getting fired, he went into Bruiser, which was great. But then immediately after Bruiser rap, he shot a zombie thing. The Misfits music video for Scream. That's 100% zombies. And I don't know if Scream would have happened if not for Rez Ev blowing up. And, um, and I guess on that same done. front, he wouldn't have eventually done Land of the Dead because if he'd done Resident Evil, his t- zombie trajectory may have been different again. Like, it's very interesting to see. It. It's a game of what yeah, was you, and what you could have may, been. You may have even seen the... Because uh, the one thing I will give Resident Evil credit for is it did reignite the zombie genre which did allow all these other projects to come about. But I, I think had George done it, you may have seen that renaissance uh, happen earlier. a couple years earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah, it would have been... 100%. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's a good time frame to think about, is that, you know, post... When Resident Evil came out that same year, there was um, 28 Days Later, which, you know, depending on who you talk to, is or isn't zombies. And then there was a, just an absolute glut of zombie media within three years it, it really just blew up and and it's funny because we, we haven't touched upon it in the script and i i've but i've told the guys about it but it's one of the, the on the podcast but it's one of those funny things that we only have zombies realistically than the style that we have them because of the same copyright era that george had you know in the in the late 60s basically meant that they were in the public domain which means people can write zombies that are very much like romero's type easily and yeah, and, they're, and we do, they're us we do you know so they're a little bit we do discuss a little bit about uh, Night of Living Dead because, you know, of course, mm. that acted Resident Evil. And uh, we do talk about briefly about the the uh, the copyright issue as well as how Night of Living Dead was received. Two things I wanted to, to touch on real quick about George in the 90s was George was attached to a lot of really big properties throughout all of the 90s. And unfortunately, he didn't get to make any of them. Uh, others came in so there was always this revolving door of george would come in uh work an idea and then someone else would get the gig everything from stephen king's it to stephen king's the stand to a remake of the mummy Um, mummy one was huge i remember that yeah there there was quite a few uh there's a few others he wrote a lot of script that unfortunately were never made one of and then of course uh was it 98 when uh you and george did iron city ass kickers correct yes sir so that was right around the time when uh resident evil the resident evil contract was uh being signed i believe and they were getting ready to start work on that so how much time do you guys have (laughs) I, I, could, I could tell you a whole bunch of projects he was assigned with that he got paid to write, but then just blew up. Uh, the Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, a Stephen King novel. And then once that was almost ready to go, that's when Stephen King got hit by the car. So everything was off. Uh, he uh, he almost did From a Buick 8, which is another Stephen King work. Uh, for those that don't realize, uh, him and Stephen King were friends. And the uh, the novel Christine is actually named after dedicated. King Horse. Yeah, it's it's the page one dedicated to George and Christine. So it, it's in there that, uh, you know, him and Stephen King were good friends. And, you know, of course, uh, not only did he adapt uh, The Dark Half, but, it, you know, they worked together on Creepshow, which Creepshow is just smorgasbord of you know all these different big names you know it was oh, kind man. of like the, the perfect storm that kind of came together and you know from the, been... the cast and the crew to even the creative team it, it's and they tried to recapture that lightning you know they brought it back essentially you know recently which is it's been very interesting to see it, the, oh, the, yeah. shining, the shining night there is greg nicotero he's a tremendous tremendous filmmaker greg nicotero made creep show the show happen so all the props to him i love the guy Love mm. it. You've got Greg Karen Nicotero, Strassman. Who, yeah, uh, I was going to say Greg Nicotero for 
any of your audience that doesn't know, not only did he work on The Walking Dead, but he's actually another George Romero Lumini. He, uh, you know, worked on Creep Show. He worked on uh, Day of the Dead, which he also has a part in it. You know, it, it's really interesting to see where all these different people that worked with George over the years kind of went. And to have Greg Nicotero, of all, you know, of all people, come back and uh, keep Creep Show alive and kind of reinvent it for a. Mm. a Generation, so J- uh, JB, you, you'll have to confirm this because I, I think it's an interesting part of the story. It's not something that we've put in. I don't think we've decided that it was worth putting in the script because we wanted to keep it simple. But George didn't immediately want to do the Resident Evil project because he was a bit uncertain about it because of the legacy and his attachment. That's correct, right? Like he, he took a while to make his decision over it and it had to be asked a couple of times. No, no, that's not how I remember it at all. It's not, not true at all? I yeah, don't so think. The, the, the recall that I've had is, is completely, that I was that I was told is completely wrong. You uh, think he, he, he went head first? Yeah, I think he was excited about it and george he wasn't the guy to kind of like hedge to get a better deal he's not that kind of guy he was just this, like oh cool right on <laughs> this is the reason why i asked this because i remember reading this and this is why i didn't put anything down in writing was because i was like this seems counterintuitive to every other time i've ever heard anything about george he always just seems to have no yeah no no limit he, he's willing to say yes on the opportunity then the, yeah then yeah. then the not yeah so that's good. I, I just wanted to clarify that while I had the chance. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, Brandon said, I think, in the earlier, the sub thing, that, you know, uh, Paul Anderson is good in pitches, good game player. George is not, he never was a good game player. He, in, in terms of zombies, for sure, he, he didn't play the game. He changed the way the game is played by creating the Romero zombie, which wiped out anything that Bela Lugosi or whatever in the 40s and 50s thought about zombies. So, no, zombies are Romero zombies right now. You cannot go back to the other. He didn't He didn't play the game. He just, he said, like, get excited about something, do it. And that's where he was with Rezaf. He wanted to make it. He wanted to make it. That, I mean, that alone, <laughs> it's so annoying, isn't it? Uh, because, you know, there's no way we would have not had, you know, a, a decent, if you know, potentially even brilliant, zombie movie so I, I think a lot of fans as, as i said in the kind of introduction they still lament the fact that um it, it never came into fruition thousands, George went on to create and direct three more zombie films with varying levels of success. Land of the Dead was released by Universal in 2005 under the largest budget George had ever had for any of these films. It did reasonably successful box office, especially coming off the back of the 2004 remake of George's Dawn of the Dead that Universal had released. This remake, directed by Zack Snyder in his directorial debut and adapted and written by a then up-and-coming James Gunn, took George's original script and developed it for a modern take. George's next two films were back to being independent with much lower budgets, 2007's Diary of the Dead and 2009's Survival of the Dead. All three of these films, much like his earlier trilogy, still had a focus on horror, but kept George's intent above subtext about other concepts within the films as well. George had plans for one more zombie film, however sadly he passed away in July of 2017 without having completely finished the script for the next planned feature. Resident Evil as a game franchise came at an odd time for zombies and media. Throughout most of the late 80s and early 90s, zombies weren't considered much for horror anymore, a combination of changing attitudes towards horror itself and monster movies in general. It may have also been added the fact in the mid-80s, zombies became more of a joke creature, especially with the return of the Living Dead films that had talking zombies asking for brains. So both Resident Evil as a game, and then the planned movie in the late 90s was really bucking the trend. The decade between Peter Jackson's 1992 classic Brain Dead, or Dead Alive as it is in some countries, and the rest of Paul W.S. Anderson's eventual take on Resident Evil really hadn't featured zombie films much at all. 
And yet within a few years it seemed like Romero type zombies were back everywhere. Not just in the cinema, but in comics, TV and other numerous video games. Even games where zombies didn't even seem to fit, there would now be zombie modes. And this has continued now for over 20 years and doesn't appear to be stopping anytime soon. It is for all these reasons that no matter what you think about George's Resident Evil script and take on the franchise, what it may or may not have been had you been able to make it, George is still highly responsible for why the series even exists and all the enjoyment we've had with it for the past 26 years and counting. What was the so now and I, I know the documentary is obviously going to cover this in a lot more detail and so you may not want to reveal everything um, uh, on on the podcast because we want people to watch the documentary absolutely. What was the the rationale from what you understand as to why Constantine decided to take the steps that they did? Was it just because Paul and you know Paul Anderson had a better pitch? Um, why 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 were, why were they getting itchy feet when you follow the the research Constantine and George actually stated this of uh, they got the rights to it and apparently the head of Constantine didn't understand what he actually had you know in a in that deepest sense of you know he knew it was a horror property he knew it was based on a video game he, he understood on a surface level what Resident Evil was but he didn't fully grasp I think what uh, what Resident Evil truly was in its purest sense you know this was part of the reason why uh, mcelroy got kicked off the project and ultimately why george wanted to you know george wanted to make uh, as he described it a balls out horror film you know if you read the script you just see how graphically violent it was and george wasn't an idiot he he knew that there was no way an american theater would ever show this kind of horror film but he saw it as potential to just film it as it is edit it down for an r rating to get that you know the butts in the seat so the uh, the mpaa wouldn't beat them up too much and then you know have that alter- alternate unrated smorgasbord of gore and you know graphic violence that george is kind of known for but constantine wanted something more commercial there, there's more more to the story than that but i constantine was kind of against the wall they had a limited amount of time with this license, with uh, the rights to the film before they would revert back to Capcom. They wanted something that they knew would be a hit, would make a pile of money to make their investment worth it. And Paul Anderson kind of came in. There was a period of time about, I'd say, a year, year and a half between George and Paul where they took some other pitches, but mm, there cool, was cool, never and there was ask. never... Yeah. There was never any scripts written. They just kind of, I, I think before Paul came in, they were willing to kind of just give up at that point because they had spent mm-hmm. so much money paying writers and getting getting uh, rewrites the scripts that, you know, they were ready to just throw their hands up and say, you know, be done with it. And then uh, as far as I'm aware, Paul Anderson kind of came in with his pitch and to kind of tie back to from the beginning of the episode, Paul Anderson had played, you know, Resident Evil 1 and 2, and he wanted to make a Resident Evil film, but he wrote a script that had uh, Constantine not accepted the pitch. He was just going to take out what few elements there were and release it as something like The Undead. Uh, and he was very forthcoming with that in recent years that it originally was written so that he could kind of neuter it of uh, trademarks and make it its own thing if uh, he wasn't going to get the gig. And that's part of the reason why the first movie doesn't feel too much like Resident Evil because he needed to ensure that he didn't have to rewrite the entire thing. You know, he just does uh, control F and find like umbrella and, you know, change it. Well, that's like what you that. were saying. That's what you were saying, Batman, weren't you? When, you know, uh, earlier you felt that <laughs> we, we, we've joked many times in the podcast, haven't we? Have, oh, there's an umbrella logo on that box, on that wall. On that... Yeah. And that's pretty disheartening as a fan, to, you know, to hear something like that, that, you know, just because he, he was unsure he was going to get the, the gig and, didn't want to have to rewrite everything. He was going to make as few references to properties of the IP well, as possible. As JB has mentioned, you know, Paul is good at the game. And one of the things as a filmmaker is when you look at that, you know, writing a spec script, something that you're going to submit to a studio, you don't want to spend all that time doing that work and get nothing in return. George was devastated to lose 
Resident Evil, not just because he loved the property, but because he had worked so hard on it. And I think Paul kind of understood that he didn't know if his chances would be good or not. So when it's your livelihood, when you know your income is based upon getting directing gigs and uh, you know that's your job, you're going to try and make smart business decisions. And as much as I dislike Anderson's films, you know, across the board, except for maybe some of his early works. I have to say that he's smart in the sense that he plays that game. I don't enjoy it. It's not something that I would personally do, but I have to give him respect for landing the amount of high profile movies that he's gotten over the years because he understands where to put his attention to. With 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 that project, it wasn't just that he wrote a spec script that he could change if they didn't go for it. And, and as Brand said, he was very much interested in the franchise rights. Correct. He found out that Constantine had them, but it's it's that he also went and found funding to pay Constantine's licensing continuation. So he went out and found a producer that he was friends with and was willing to take the risk on paying the next rights renewal for Constantine. So it didn't cost Constantine anything other than time. Time to wait on him to bring back the script and some meetings for them to make a decision on greenlighting a film. That was it. Yeah, because uh, Capcom, I believe, typically for movie rights does something like uh, like a five-year license. Because we saw that with, can't think of his name, he did uh, Street Fighter Assassin's Fist, which wasn't a fan film that was actually a legit production that the writer and director paid the rights for and Capcom loved it so much that they had him come back and do uh, Street Fighter Resurrection which was like a, a 30 minute tie in to Street Fighter 5 and he was working with a company to do the sequel to Assassin's Fist called World Warrior which was going to be like a you know like a 10 episode TV series or something and unfortunately mm. so you would it was a, yeah and you so would, you would assume, his, you would assume his, the rights were going to Kent would would expire in 2001 if it was a five-year purchase yeah it, it would have would have probably been around uh like the end of 2001 typically productions you know you had to have productions in by the end of that so considering I, I think they beat it by a year i'm not sure if they actually had to to pay for the rights again but i know that just from the research it seemed like anderson had this kind of like backup plan in case development took longer because you know you write a draft and then the executive's look through it, make notes and kind of send it back. And, you know, it's all, it's all this collaborative process where you kind of got to meet all the, the check marks for a film in order to kind of get it, get it going. So Brandon, it's like Rashomon. I have a, a different take on Anderson and Constantine and George. <laughs> yes. And your, yours is more informed by actually being there. So that, that's oh, one of the reasons with some of those why, people. Yeah. I think from my point of view i said not a lot of this information is widely known and i think obviously your documentary is obviously going to really bring that to the forefront you know a lot of mainstream media are obviously aware yeah. that he was aware and now now it's going to be like okay i can almost picture you know that that kind of that heartbreak whatever uh, you're gonna that your information is going to reveal it's not like oh he was signed on you know he did a little bit no, nothing major and then it moved on no 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 what you're saying now is he was 110 percent behind this project and it was taken away from him and i think that takeaway is going to be enormous and i think really heartbreaking <laughs> and it's it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely it's, the reason why brand really is pitching for this idea of, of of not only just having these talking heads but showing thematically what also we're missing out on because yeah. and, and and these scenes potentially as well because they add to that impact of what we could have had and and what it would have felt like and it so it continues to sell that idea and what George's vision was. And I think that to me is, is such an important part of the, the whole process as well is that people understand not just how passionate he was, but the sort of thing that they would have got had he managed to get it that Constantine unfortunately decided there was, was not the direction they wanted. I've had very relatively little exposure to a lot of what's been talked tonight, which is why I've just sort of been sat back listening. But one of the things that I have sort of had a look at and was was hugely interested in was Bernie Wrightson's um, concept art of the tyrant that I think was revealed in the early 2000s. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. just kind of wondering, and I don't know whether you can actually tell us tonight, but in, in sort of going through the archives, are we, are we due to see any more sort of exceptional designs? Because as obviously as someone who has the tyrant as my namesake, like that concept art is, is just testament to something that has truly like been lost 
and we'll never ever get because it's about as authentic as you could ever imagine like certainly a concept art would be and obviously I know, I know i know wrightson's not with us anymore he passed away in 2017 sadly but was there anything in the archive that is is there that we know we might get to see our goal is to show you everything that was ever done for this movie as for the archive the archive really only concerns what george did there's a few extra pieces but they never submitted any of the artwork to the archive so there are things that we have in our possession that the archive does not and there are other things that we're acquiring that no one else has so that that's part of the goal of working with you know these different entities to try and try and finally show the world the the full complete story as you know jb has said this will be the definitive word on what happened and that's part of the reason why it's probably 90 minutes two hours long once it's finished because there's more to this than what you can read in you know some internet article or a five minute youtube video you know mm. not everyone has gone to the lengths of research that we have and even rob has uncovered a lot of additional information including untranslated interviews that kind of fill in the mindsets of different people uh that were involved with resident evil or with the movie itself but yeah we're our goal is to show you absolutely everything and kind of interview every single person that could possibly have been a part of major events in George's life, as well as the movie production and even the Biohazard 2 commercial. So, you know, this is this is all all in the plan. Well, and, I, I, and, very exciting. Yeah. There was yeah. just, um, and obviously, don't mention any names because obviously, save it for your documentary. But do you, does the does the documentary go into any anybody who was approached in terms of casting or anything like that? Did it get that far, or was it? Was no, it no, no. No, it, it's uh, JB has some interesting insight into suggested actors for roles. Uh, of I think that's something that because it's very exclusive, I don't want to give that away just yet. Oh, absolutely, yeah, I would. I would yeah, 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 that's fine. Definitely an eye opener. Uh, but uh, I, I, can I just say, I'm not. I'm not going to. All the internet rumors were were never true. You know, true that was true. yeah, that's cool. exactly what I was about to say. I mean, yeah. rumors about. You know Bruce Campbell and what was it Sarah Michelle Geller and Geller you know, and Jason well, Patrick. That was another one at the Jason time. Patrick I remember that big one back in the nineties. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to say J J J one of JV's <laughs> one of JV's suggestions, which I will not say what it was, but if if that had been his suggestion and um, George had gone with it, would have been a very interesting where we are now and how how that particular person has gone, and not in a bad I way. Agree. I think it would have oh, been absolutely. He knows exactly who I'm talking about. It'd be very very interesting. He, very even interesting. just not by mentioning names that's something tantalizing to look forward to absolutely <laughs> i well, i'll say this much he's a very big actor now very big actor it's george didn't know who he was it's like hey man watch this it's like oh wow so when can we hear more about this amazing project now you said off air that coming up in august we ha uh, you are attending a particular a very special event did you want to elaborate on what event you're attending uh yes that event would be creature feature weekend which is at the end of august we were actually invited to do a panel so we're gonna do like an hour-long panel and show off a teaser trailer that'll be with the um the executive producer matt anderson from key 13 films and of course jason will be there as well from image 987 by the time this podcast comes out all going well <laughs> that creature feature convention would have happened so if anyone doesn't yes. know i'd if you want to explain, what what is creature feature maybe the first time people have heard about it what type of convention is it and you know what and then then we can talk maybe about that that, that teaser you've just i teased about <laughs> so creature feature weekend is a pretty decent size convention in pennsylvania it's on its fourth year now uh, they wanted to do things differently than a lot of the other horror conventions that are kind of in the area. So while they do get a lot of really big guests, like this year they have, for example, Tom Savini will be there. Uh, one of the things that the owner does is he likes to highlight independent horror films, especially those that are filmed in the area. So I've gotten to know him pretty well over the years, and he 
unknowingly contributed to the making of the teaser film or the the teaser trailer. We we might as well talk about the teaser, I guess. I mean, start with that contribution if you're able to talk about it, and then yeah, talk about what the what what it is that you've well well at this point by the time people are hearing this will have shown at the event we wanted to do things a certain way like i'm very much about analog technology and making sure that there's a certain visual style and it kind of feeds back into the project itself so the teaser trailer is kind of like a you know one or two minute version of what the actual documentary will feel like so a few years ago when i had met the convention owner he had done a post about night of living dead and i had kind of given my story about how i originally watched the film and he was very very impressed kind of at a loss of words on how to describe it but he wanted to help me find that vhs tape and it turned out that he had actually had a the same copy of the exact same vhs tape that my mother had owned so he gave it to me for free with a warning that there was no no guarantee that it would work but Mm. i just wanted a version of that with that clamshell case with the specific piece of artwork on it because it meant a lot to me and because he's only about an hour away it could be that through the exchange of hands over the years it could very well be the same exact copy copy my mother owned <laughs> you know it's it's i've actually shown it to um russ striner and um gary striner and gary had said that he had never even seen that version before because you know there's so many mm. versions of night of living dead but even he was at a loss of words so to have one of the one of the people that worked on the film kind of be like wow that's you know a very unique copy so anyway how it features in the uh, the teaser is we actually have i would say about 10 seconds of night of the living dead playing on a uh, old style tv in this decrepit looking set that stands in for the um, for the spencer mansion labs and uh, that's how we kind of open the teaser because we're talking about George Romero, who directed Night of the Living Dead and created the modern concept of the zombie and the inspiration for Resident Evil. So we kind of pay homage to that. So I got to, you know, message him and say, hey, thanks for the tape. It really came in handy. And I actually <laughs> sent him a, uh, a screen grab from the uh, the proxy files. The head that showed it playing on the TV and it was like, hey, by the way, it still works after nice. <laughs> probably 35, almost 40 years. Which and is, I mean, good quality. Impressive. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's still for a VHS tape. It is in great shape. So <laughs> I don't know how this thing survived the way it did, <laughs> but it was like we started playing it on the set and we're like, oh my God, this looks great. The That's, a, that's very impressive. VHS is really, yeah, they shouldn't last that well especially when you don't know if they've been how they've been stored and everything the fact that it played maybe it's a good sign that's it that's it's a, a, yes. a real it's an omen of of, of uh, you know the connection where you were um displaying it and everything it's a it's a great great sign everything with the teaser has been a great omen it was a stressful shoot as like everything on this project it grew in size on what we intended <laughs> and it was it was pretty ridiculous what we were trying to pull off originally what it was is we wanted to just do like a really quick 10 second promo for creature feature weekend you know just something really cool to kind of support the convention you know maybe push in on a typewriter kind of give people clues on what we were going to do and kind of lead up to when um, creature feature weekend would announce the panel and of course some of the other producers kind of gave their notes and they just said hey why don't we just do a full teaser if you're gonna film something let's do something a little bit bigger we will attach it to the press kit once that goes live we can show it and you'll have something physical for the the convention so so i spoke with the convention owner of creature feature weekend and he loved the idea that he would have something that for the time being would be an exclusive only to his event to have um you know a little bit of footage to show off thankfully already had a script in mind it was just an idea usually when i get ideas for stuff i quickly ripped them up so i dressed the thing up sent it out everyone liked it and then next thing i know 
were in you know were running into pre-production which meant that um the cinematographer who lives in italy got a bunch of money we rented all our equipment in italy and he flew over from Italy to shoot this thing. The, the thing that we, I think we can talk about it because I, I don't know when eventually the teaser will become more public. But the, you, you did some makeup tests and you've, you've got a zombie in your the actual teaser itself. Is there more you can talk about the inspirations for what you wanted the look to be and and how that feels in regards to like Romero's legacy and 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 the game itself as well. We actually did do an entire zombie. Uh, that was done by Greg Sturtz. He had actually worked with ADI on uh, Harbinger Down. That was their um, answer to the CGI prequel, The Thing. Infamously got all their work replaced by CGI. Mm. So he had worked on that and even had a, uh, a bit part. He was like the first person to get killed off in the movie. He lives in the area, so we got uh, pretty decent acquaintances, and I had him in mind immediately as soon as I seen his work. So the uh, he had actually ended up playing the role of the zombie. Very dedicated. He even shaved his uh, facial hair off for the role. Then the makeup was... Uh, he did, like, some of the prosthetic work for it, and then the makeup itself was done by Paige Willem. She's a student of Tom Savini, so she went to... Uh, Tom Savini's uh, makeup school over in Pittsburgh. They did a bunch of tests on it. You know, we had meetings about it. The idea was to kind of do something that hadn't been seen in a while because, you know, a lot of the, the zombie makeup effects that you see nowadays are kind of inspired by Greg Nicotero's work on The Walking Dead. You could even see from the, the trailer, the Netflix series Resident Evil, that a lot of the zombies just felt like they were continuing that same look, that same style. What we wanted to do was kind of go back to more of a, a Tom Savini style zombie. So a lot of makeup and dentures, and it just kind of has that specific look. And what we did was we actually recreated more or less. It's our version of it, but we wanted to do the uh, the turning zombie. You know, that's a very, very iconic moment. Yes. From the original mm -hmm. video game. So, so of course, fans saw it in uh, Welcome to Raccoon City, and then they're going to see ours. <laughs> you know, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be some comparisons once the, uh, the teaser trailer gets out, but it's, it's less overall prosthetic work, you know, where you just basically have a entire person's head in latex and mm -hmm. very much strategically building out someone's face and then applying the correct makeup and the correct lighting to make it look as good as it can. And the results were pretty amazing. Oh, Overjoyed. I, I mean, I saw the, the, even just the test, I couldn't believe. I was like, that's a style I have not seen for, for a while. And it just looks so good. So yeah, it was, it's really cool to hear all that because it's just, yeah, I think people are going to be um, really, really interested in seeing that. And, and it's that sort of thing that you want. I got to say, Craig was absolutely a trooper on this because the set was there's a lot of work put into it we lucked out i mean we're we don't have the budget of of the documentary you know this was all put together last minute and we're really going into really doing independent filmmaking with this so it was a lot of favors a lot of we lucked out and found someone's basement that we could use like a really old basement and it was owned by Paige. Paige just said, look, do whatever you want to do to this. And we did. I mean, we painted the walls and started painting it to look like there was mold growing all over it. We bought a lot of props off of uh, Facebook Marketplace of all places. We're looking for like industrial shelving and metal desks. The hardest thing we, we had to find was a freaking chair. Like I was doing so much work driving all over the state looking for the exact items that we needed. And and to try and get this all pulled together, really, it was just a couple weeks. So we set dressed this entire thing. On that end, most of the uh, the initial work was done by myself because when it came to to shoot the thing, you know, it was really the cinematographer and I doing most of the work because Paige and Craig were out at his shop, you know, like 40 minutes away, getting all the makeup prepared. 
and then they had to drive the set. We worked on it. I worked on it initially to get all the major items there and uh, get things done. And then uh, we started putting everything down into the basement and getting everything dressed up. I think Paige was running around like ripping cobwebs down out of the basement and then like repurposing them over items. And we had dozens of props that needed fixed up. Uh, the executive producer just happened to have like some old 1930s typewriter that looks like ripped straight out of the Resident Evil game. And it had that distinct age that we needed. So mm. we're hefting this like 40 pound typewriter down in the basement. We have like jars with, you know, creatures and little stuff in them that looks right out of, you know, it, you know, it ended up looking like something you would see in the video game. Like, we, we spared no expense on this teaser, but it, a lot of it was coming out of people's personal pockets, I think. I think I spent close to $700 myself between buying all these bulky props and last-minute stuff. I had people give, gifting me money towards this, so that kind of ramped up. And then one of the producers spent a good chunk to get, get the cinematographer over here and and uh, running the equipment and the insurance and you know it, it's a lot of work we spent a couple days on set and then driving around for last minute items and we were trying to find specific things to help age everything and it was funny we couldn't find anything so it, it was just weird like i think at one point people were probably getting terrified of us because we would we would come in and you know try and look for like iron oxide and you know, all these like weird items. You have a saline solution and, you know, like just random shit that probably most store employees never get asked. So we probably looked real shady, you know? <laughs> the day before the shoot, we spent 19 hours working on the set. That was all prep. Thankfully, at a last minute, I found some recipe to create rust out of like three different shades of paint and cinnamon of all things <laughs> so i mean we are baking cinnamon right onto like all of the stuff just paint and cinnamon and i can still remember like our luck because like we had so much misfortune just getting to the film day you know the cinematographer uh there's some issue with his flight and he left italy late and then he got held up in chicago at at customs and then he couldn't get his get his flight to where we were shooting in time. And he had to kind of divert. So we missed the whole day just with him traveling and getting held up. And then we spent a day running all over the place and getting stuff prepped. And then come Friday, the day before the shoot, it was like a 19-hour day. And the cinnamon that we use, we, we, I have no idea how much we use. Probably like 10 pounds of cinnamon. It was uh, ridiculous. Smell good though, but we're out there just painting this desk, and I mean, it's like 95 degrees out. I mean, the sun is beating down on us, and we're painting. And I was like, man, this is actually kind of kind of good for us. You, you know, it's hot, but this thing is drying quickly. We should absolutely be able to get this thing down into the basement in like an hour, and we'll we'll move on. And I mean. Next thing you know, the whole sky goes dark. And I mean, it just drops rain on us. And we're out in the open. And I mean, we're just watching all of our work on this desk just start disappearing. And it's like, no, 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 no. And uh, we're grabbing this desk. Paint's going everywhere. And, you know, it's a metal desk. Like, this thing weighs, weighs a ton and we're trying to and we're trying to carry it in a way that it's not uh ripping the paint off and we're trying to drag it up onto this port uh so we can continue working so we lost time there waiting on the desk to dry and then of course with it being so humid out it's not drying now so that was like six hours to finish this desk and get it down into the basement so we had just moved on to the interior work and continued from there but yeah we got we got offset around 1 a.m and call time is sick and as soon as we get back it's like okay well i still need to do the um the video files we do have some game footage in there but we didn't just want to layer it in and post so we actually recorded game footage off of an old tv on set as part of the uh the teaser and I know a lot of this probably ain't making sense to uh, the listeners on like how it would look. It looks pretty damn good. We wanted everything to feel analog, and you know, there's kind of still a connection there with Resident Evil because of you know Resident Evil Seven had videotapes in it, and of course um, Romero script has um, video footage in it. 
you know, there's a, a part in the script where they actually look at, I think it's when the hunters attack the uh, the lab tech technicians. It's like your first glimpse of a hunter. So we kind of wanted to honor that and do something that was kind of really cool and interesting and make this whole place look crappy. So we wake up at like 6 a.m., get on set, and we get everything set up. And I'm still not sure about this. I mean, we were working so fast, so hard to get this thing ready. And I'm just looking at it like, man, I really don't know. I mean, I have faith, but I'm looking at this set and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I'm ready to throw up being that nervous looking at it. Like, I just don't want to have to spend all this money and it's going to look bad. But then, you know, the next thing you know, we black out the whole set. 100% pitch black and then we set up the lighting and we start strategically placing this lighting in you know we have a little desk lamp we got leds that are kind of highlighting the shelves like it starts really looking like a like a really cool set and i mean in that moment i was like okay this looks like the arkley labs everything's come together yeah and right when Craig gets there and we get ready to roll cameras, we take about 10 gallons of water and we dump it across this floor. And, you know, it just looks like this wet, miserable, disgusting lab straight out of the uh, the remake. Amazing. And, and like I said, Craig was a trooper because it was like 90 plus degrees down in this basement. It's the first basement I've ever been to where it's hot as hell. And I mean, we are sweating buckets and he's in all this makeup and miserable. And we had this desk, the chair that we got for it, which was like a last minute addition. You know, we had roughed it all up. And then like the last minute, uh, it was like a real bright blue. So we had to kind of subdue that, you know, make it look old and disgusting and kind of get rid of that color. But we soaked it. So when it came time for him to sit to do the, um, the turning motion i mean he just sits in this wet chair and you can just see the beads of sweat on the back of him like we're touching up makeup with every shot well pages but she's touching up the makeup with every shot and we kind of we had a fan on him to try and give him some comfort but he was great the whole time the makeup was great there was like one one alteration that we did right when we did the uh, the turning shot it was um an effect that they had on uh, the eye and originally we were going to do live maggots well because of the uh, the amount of work that had to get done we just didn't have the time to go buy maggots and put them all over craig and you know <laughs> do it that way I'm sure he was grateful. Oh, he was perfectly fine with it, believe it or not. That's one of the reasons why I was so excited was because I had this guy that was willing to do whatever just to really sell, you know, this idea of a decomposing corpse. We we had to switch out a piece of prosthetic and it was last minute and everyone, you know, there was definitely the frustration there. But everyone just chipped in, you know, replaced the prosthetic got the makeup done and i think we finished filming craig in about three hours and that included multiple setup multiple takes of each setup we got uh craig and page out of there and then spent a few more hours getting our tv footage recorded and a lot of insert shots and you know even the uh the title screen is done uh by filming off of a tv Mm. and it just looks really cool like a, we wanted every single thing in this teaser to just feel like you're rediscovering this project. We took news articles and pictures and just dirtied everything up. And it looks like this old forgotten lab with all the stuff in it. So it was a really cool, um, really cool time. Uh, it was like, wow, that's the reward. Yeah. That is some amazing work for what we had time wise and the amount of effort that went into it. It was like, oh, my God, that that looks like it, it looks like a million dollar movie. I think what you've done, obviously, we can't show it, obviously, because because a podcast uh, <laughs> media, media limitations. But I think what you've demonstrated to the our listeners is that passion. And this is just for the teaser, which presumably is not, not going to last a particularly long amount of time, uh, you know, lengthy amount of time. But I think you've been able to you said, show just how much, you know, how much this means to you and the rest of the production team. Um, and, and the reason why you, you want to tell this story. So if there's any indication of how the final product's going to be, it certainly sounds like that, you know, people who watch this are going to be in for a real treat. Oh, yeah. Everyone about this was extremely passionate. Yeah. 
and like everyone really pulled together to get this made just from everything that we pulled together that we are 100% comfortable uh, showing this off and I, I think even though you only get glimpses of some of the more Resident Evil elements I think it's there that it's personally I feel like it's something that fans have been waiting for and I don't mean to knock Constantine or, you know, any of the work that they've done, but we showed it off to, I want to say, about 20 or 30 people in private just to get notes, you know, kind of get general reactions. And usually the, the notes came back and it's just a string of curse words. Like <laughs> every single person had some sort of combination of curse words put in for how much they liked it. And they, awesome. they just said, this is what, what we've been waiting for. Sounds extremely exciting and lucky for the people that, by the time this podcast come out, has attended Creature Feature and got to see it. So um, hopefully, we'll, uh, the, as you say, the rest of the world we had to see it in due course. But um, yeah, this is exciting times. As a fan of George Romero and definitely a fan of Resident Evil, this is a passion. You know, it's very much a passion project. I'm not someone that was just hired to do this for a quick buck. You know, this has been a big piece of my life. So I'm really hoping that that what I'm doing really resonates with the fans. Is there anything final you want to kind of say just to, you know, again, tease the fans? What it's like, When can we expect to be able to see this? How, how can people be able to watch this documentary? Okay, so this isn't, you know, this isn't going to be a YouTube video. Uh, this is going to be picked up for distribution. I mean, let, let's be honest here. It's going to go to whoever gives us the most amount of money. This isn't being made for $5,000 and a couple pizzas. We have a lot of a lot of backing into this, so we have to be realistic. Uh, you know, we, we have to ensure that the uh, the investors, the financiers, uh, you know, get their money back. We are in the middle of finding distribution because that's also going to inform how much higher. Because uh, I was given multiple numbers and it's all based upon what, you know, distribution gives us. Because, and we have a couple different distribution plans. Um, I'm not going to name drop anything on what's on what's being lined up but our goal is we are currently in pre-production right now and this will be a multi-tiered approach to it so the documentary comes first and we're going to work out the details on um, the potential filming of any scenes from the script that will be its own pre-production because that we're not going to go hire a team of professionals to get all the elements that we need and then let them sit so we kind of have to do this where it's sort of like overlapping on itself but our goal is to have this out in 2024 you know as of you know resident evil can be cursed at times so sometimes you can have setbacks but we have all the the major elements locked in and we have more uh that'll be kind of forthcoming over over the next few months Fantastic. yeah so 2024 would be a tentative release date i think that's i want to say that that's you know too long but yeah um, i, I, uh, I, can, I yeah. can appreciate the uh yeah absolutely well i can speak on behalf of everyone we are very excited about this and um based on your you know unbridled passion i'm sure i'm sure it's going to be a huge success so uh, yeah, this you. has been yes this has been a huge thing and please jv he is a wonderful person and he has a lot of insight into george's life and the resident evil project and you know jb also has the um, pittsburgh moving picture festival which is uh gonna be in is it october jb yes Right before Halloween, oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure JB could speak more about that, but uh, one of the things that Image987 is uh, doing is kind of giving this opportunity for independent filmmakers to uh, showcase their work, kind of bring back the uh, the independent film industry that is... Pittsburgh has a long history, a long cinematic history. You know, there's it's more than just George, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, attending that. It, it's, it's and that's cool. something something that George himself was a big supporter of was you know independent filmmakers and 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 people in the industry there. So it's nice to hear that that continues also through other people like JB and and others as well. The horror, I'm afraid, gentlemen, does not end there. Oh no, because we always like to engage with our guests as we play a very special edition of Neptune's. Biohazard Quiz! 25 years of Resident Evil. 10 years of the Resident Evil podcast. 
expert knowledge is needed in what we call the quiz. This is my only opportunity for a point this week. Uh, I'd just like to announce everybody that uh, this is zero points for me this week. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. We've talked about the games straying too far from the origins. This Resident Evil quiz. If we're now getting Spice Girls as the correct answer. I mean, it's time to quit. Welcome to Neptune's Biohazard Quiz. What? 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 Neptune Biohazard Quiz. Holy smokes. Okay, the quiz. I forgot about the quiz. Let's do the quiz. Can Brendan yeah. and I be on a team? <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Regular listeners will, of course, know the format. I've got five questions. I'm going to say the five questions. Have a think in your minds of the answers. You can write them on Notepad. No Googling. No, that's, that's also a message to George. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go through the five questions and then we'll see how well everyone does so let's let's play the quiz so question number one who played claire redfield in the live action biohazard 2 commercial so i think you're gonna get all these i think you do i've, I've yeah usually i get criticized for doing very too hard questions question number two who plays the uncredited role of Dr. Birkin in the first Resident Evil movie that also narrates the introduction? Question number three. What is the name of the restaurant in the shopping mall Dead Rising? You can see that we've got a bit of a theme. There's a, look how I've combined three franchises. I mean, that's staggering. Anyway, question number four. The blood-stained khaki-wearing zombie in Resident Evil 2 shares a striking resemblance to which Dawn of the Dead character? And finally, question number five. We've talked about this earlier today. Which is the most successful Resident Evil movie in terms of box office takings? They're the five questions. Join us after this one. We'll run through those answers. They're the, they don't have a lot of power. They move slowly. And you can defeat them easily one at a time. Um, but when there's enough of them... And uh, when you're not very organized yourself or your group can't communicate or whatever, you know, they're going to get you. And that, that's the, those are thematically what I've always worked with. Welcome back to Neptune's Biohazard Quiz. Let's see how well everyone has done. I think we're going to get high folk, uh, high schools, folks. So question number <laughs> one. <laughs> I think we will. Uh, who played Claire Redfield in the live-action Biohazard 2 commercial? George Trevor, we'll start should, with you. I should know the answer to this. I don't... I've... I've uh, no, sorry. No, Rombie? Adrian Franz. Okay, Batman? I could only remember Adrian. I, I honestly couldn't remember the surname, I'm afraid. Uh, Star Stone? I only had Adrian as well. I could not remember for the life of me that has her name. Okay, JB, did you know? <laughs> I did, yeah. I was on set with her. Adrian Franz. <laughs> <laughs> Bran, did you know? I, I hope the God I would know. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian France is correct. Well done. So uh, points all round to Robbie Bran, Jason. Half a point for Batman and Stars Tyrant. Nil point <laughs> for George Trevor. <laughs> there we go. Question number two: Who plays the uncredited role of Doctor Birkin in the first Resident Evil movie that narrates his introduction? Stars Tyrant is Jason, Jason Isaacs, I believe. Jason Isaacs. Robbie. Yeah, Jason Isaacs. George Trevor. I didn't know this one either. I'm afraid. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Batman? Definitely not. He didn't Google today. <laughs> uh, yes, Jason Isaacs. Jason Isaacs. Bran? Uh, who works with Paul W.S. Anderson on his previous two films, and the character Dr. Isaacs is named after. Correct. So, Jason? No, I, I had John Larroquette because he did the voiceover <laughs> for the original Texas Chainsaw. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, it is Jason Isaacs, yes. Uh, Malchus Lucefroy Lucefroy himself. So there we go. Points there to Bran, Batman, Romby, and Stars Tyrant. Well done. Question at number three. What is the name of the restaurant in the shopping mall d- that appears in Dead Rising? Batman. Uh, Jill's Sandwiches. Jill's Sandwiches. Bran. Uh, Jill's Sandwiches. JB. Uh, I did not have oh, Jill's no. Sandwiches. <laughs> George, what did what did you put? Oh, wait. So I was just busy googling what Dead Rising is. What, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Rumby. Uh, Jill's sandwiches. Does turn. Jill's sandwiches. It is Jill's sandwiches. Yes. <laughs> uh, I thought I, I said it kind of combined Dawn of the Dead, Dead Rising, and Resident Evil. It is true. They had to put a sticker on the front so that people didn't get confused. They're set in a mall. Do you, do you get it, everybody listening at home? Yeah. <laughs> it <was> a, it <laughs> <laughs> Question at number four. The blood-stained khaki-wearing zombie in Resident Evil 2 shares a striking resemblance to which Dawn of the Dead character? Star Star and... I couldn't remember the name. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm going to have to pass. Okay. George Trevor? It's a full house of zero for me this week. <laughs> <laughs> Rumby. Even even I'm confused by this one. Nick, I've got nothing. No. no. Batman, did you know? No, I'm I'm glad Rob said that because I I wondered where you were going with this one as well. Okay. Bran. If it's the one that I'm thinking of, I want to say that it's the um and it's only because this model appeared in the other uh in the game as one of the zombie models was mm. uh, is it isn't it like the poster child for Dawn of the Dead? It's like the messed up redneck looking zombie with the flannel shirt and like half its face all screwed up. It's either that or it's uh Steven. Steven, okay. Jason. I was pure guess. The Hari Krishna zombie. <laughs> Someone may that have would to be awesome. It. So the answer I've got is Flyboy. Is that Stephen? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's Stephen. Yeah. Uh, See, I, I wasn't exactly sure because I knew that the um, the iconic Dawn of the Dead zombie from the uh, the posters kind of I mean, became the poster crowd for Dawn of the man. Dead. That was uh, that was in the game as well. That's so, uh, Dave Emge. Yeah, Dave Emge. It's a little bit of trivia. He worked at the World Trade Center when 9-11 happened. He was at work at the World Trade Center when uh, 9-11 happened. Dave Hemke. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, I, That's a true story. Uh, I was going to say, there's that other reference of obviously from the re- from a Resident Evil remake of the zombie up, um, getting up off the table as well, mm. which is such an iconic mm-hmm. shot. And yeah. finally, then, question number five. George has got a chance with this one. Surely, which is the most successful Resident Evil movie in terms of box office takings? We'll come to George last because I, I think most people probably have to guess this one. So, uh, uh, George, can you right. listen to the, uh, the popular answers? Uh, JB, what 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 are you gonna say? Well, the now, third one. The third was that's extinction. Okay, Bran. Gonna say the final chapter. The final to number six. Okay, Batman. What do you think was the most successful? I'm gonna guess the fourth one, Afterlife. Yes. Afterlife is the fourth one. Okay, Romby. Uh, I think it is the last one. The final chapter. Final okay. chapter. Uh, Stars turn. I was gonna say Afterlife as well because I just thought it came at a time when, like, you know, everything was trying to market 3D and it would have had some nonsense inflated 3D sales. So uh, Afterlife. Okay, George Trevor. I, I mean, I can't believe I'm getting points almost out of pity now, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> to avoid the wooden spoon. Yeah. Um. Honestly, my guess, if you'd asked me at the start, was going to be the, the the final one. But I have to be completely honest and say, I didn't even know it was called the final chapter. My answer would have been... <laughs> if you'd asked me at the beginning, my answer would have been the last film. And if you'd pushed me to give the, if you'd pushed me to give the name, I wouldn't have known the name. But I now know the name is the final chapter. I presume it's the final chapter. It is the final Tis. one. Yeah. The, the final insult. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you go? You, you go I'm going to... Go, yeah, the, the last one. The final chapter. I'm reliably informed it's called... <laughs> Well, the good the, the good news is that someone has got at least one person has got the right answer. It is Afterlife is the most wow. successful with uh, sixty million at the box office. Oh, are we so, going with domestic? We're going with domestic, not international. Oh shit! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the like, tune, yeah, final that chapter the tune. so well overseas. Yep, yeah, I missed that part. Yeah, uh, apologies. I would have probably oh, still got it wrong. Oh, there we go. So Afterlife is the most successful. Uh, domestic domestically today. yeah oh, it's that... not it's not internationally internationally i think it is the final chapter i'll sneakily edit that in that way no no you, you won't look at it <laughs> no 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the bloopers. 
bad googling by me. There we go. So let's have a look at so at the uh, final scores. High scores this week, as I as I predicted. I think that's right. I don't know. Yeah. So the uh, in bottom place with zero, it is I'm afraid George with naught out of five. Sorry, George. That's that's fine. That's fine. I'm sure that's the first time I've ever got zero. Probably technically, not. technically, he would have got a one if the question had been international, not. Um, <laughs> yes. So I'm, going yeah, I'm blaming Neptune for that. Of course. <laughs> can we can we at least let our guests know that I don't usually get zero? <laughs> he actually quite often wins, and he usually wins the season finale somehow every time. <laughs> J, uh, JP, you, you what? One out of five for you. Whoa! Congratulations. Second, next is uh, Rombie with three. Oh wow! Whoop. Not congrats. Very good. Sean, you got three and a half, didn't you? Three and a half, Nicholas. Yes, I'll I'll total it yes. up for you. Yes, you got three and a half. <laughs> I, I got three, and, three and, a and a half. Yeah, I got three <laughs> and a half. And this week's winner, Brown with four. Holy Toledo, right on. Very good. In my defense, I I got set up with that last question <laughs> through my <laughs> through, through my own reluctance to pay attention to it, uh, and I also hate the movies, so. <laughs> 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 so there we go there the that's the uh final the final quiz with uh this week's winner being brown with four out of five congratulations to you join us next time when we'll have some more questions I hope everyone has enjoyed our discussions there with uh, Bran and JB. It's been um, a fascinating teaser into what we can expect. Hopefully in 2024, maybe earlier, who knows? Keep our fingers crossed. Um, no doubt we'll keep everyone as well posted on uh, in, in latest news uh, in future podcasts. Uh, if anyone up... wants to... Sorry, Nick. Just no, say, Rob, if anyone oh, no. wants to read, read the script and understand a bit more about george's vision it is available online if you just google resident evil george romero script it's pretty much probably going to be the first thing that pops up in google it's hosted there's a copy of the one that was put up in 2001 it's been re-hosted on a daily scripts i think is the website and there's there'll be other copies and there's probably other people's reactions to it and so forth but um the script's definitely worth the read so yeah if you're interested and want to learn more about george's ideas and and peter's because that was his co-writer and co-producer then yeah read it check it out so on that note i'd again like to extend my thanks to jb and bran for joining us um we hope everyone has enjoyed this deep dive into uh, something that we we don't often look into but we've been absolutely honored and delighted to be able to do so and share it with everyone uh, so on that note it is goodbye for me neptune goodbye from me batman goodbye for me jb destiny goodbye for me stars tyrant goodbye for me george trevor goodbye for me rumby and it's goodbye for me bran Thank you.